Camparanus. Um, <clears throat> this one is a rather complex piece of apparatus, and it measures the resistance to the passage of an electrical current by the rocks or your bodies, if one's fortunate, beneath the surface. And the way that it does that is that spikes of this kind are placed in the ground, two of them. And a current is passed through from one spike to the other, through the earth, that is. The, this wire simply carries the current from the machine to the spike. And from the spike, the current moves to another spike at a distance away. So those two are planted in the ground. And then, with another pair of spikes, one moves around the area and measures the resistance between that second pair of spikes, which one plants at a known distance each time they're put in, measures the resistance to the passage of the electrical current, which is being produced in the ground by the two transmitting spikes, if you like. And if there's an ore body in the area, then the ore body will conduct the electricity through the ground with much greater efficiency than will normal soil or normal rock. So once again, by moving around with one's two testing spikes, if you like, one can plot the position of an ore body. So that's electrical resistivity. Now, another piece of apparatus that depends upon the magnetic field exerted by an ore body is this one. And this measures, or well, this magnetometer measures the magnetic field which is caused by the presence of a large body of iron in the ground. So if we place this over this chunk of iron formation, which you remember uh, from sedimentary rocks and from Precambrian, quite a common kind of Precambrian iron ore, and we turn the apparatus on, then on. And so there's a deflection of this needle indicating the presence of some material that is acting like a magnet. In other words, this is the apparatus to use in order to detect the presence of iron. Now then, another kind of apparatus which also depends upon the magnetic field is this one over here. This is a relatively simple kind of instrument. Standing on a tripod, this lower apparatus here, or lower part of the apparatus, simply uh, is used to make sure that the tripod is standing vertically. But up here is a needle, like a compass needle, only instead of being able to swing around in a circle, it can only swing up and down. And you'll see that it's oriented like this. It's measuring the tilt of the Earth's magnetic field here. And if there were a body of iron beneath this tripod, then the tilt of that needle would be influenced by the body of iron, in just the same way as the magnetometer we've just looked at was influenced. And the needle would swing much more vertically down, pointing towards the body of iron. So this is the kind of thing that one can cart around and plant in the earth and in that way detect or with its own magnetic field. Very good for iron ore deposits, but a very simple kind of apparatus and quite an early kind. Now, the one that's rather more complicated and doesn't tell us exactly where an ore body is, but tells us where bedrock is, which is sometimes very important, is this instrument here, this seismograph. Now then, there are three parts to it. This part here is the part of the seismograph which receives shock waves. Remember, we've looked at seismographs that detect earthquake shock waves. Let's put this out on the floor so that when we get this apparatus to work, that's already in position. The other important part of the apparatus is this hammer, which generates the shock waves. And on it is a little switch here, which closes when the hammer hits the ground. The other part of the instrument is this part here, which records shock waves generated by this hammer. Now, if we switch that on, 
and move out about 10 feet away from the receiving uh, phone. Then go back and look at our recorder. On it, I hope you can see a number of black spots. Each of those black spots represents a shock received by the apparatus because of the hammer blow that I did on the floor. There are many dots because some of those represent reflections from rock and pipes and whatever that's beneath the floor here. Now, in the field, what each of those pulses would represent is a reflecting layer in the bedrock reflecting back the shock wave generated by the hammer. Now, speaking of the structure of the bedrock, there's another way we can get at it, and that's by drilling into it. Now, surprisingly enough, there are good portable drills, and this is a portable drill over here. Motor, and here the drill barrel, and the diamond bit at the end, and water cooled by water, which passes into the uh, drill core tube, from this uh, pipe here. Now, depending on the size of the drill barrel, one can get different diameters of core and sometimes go down quite a long way. This apparatus, for example, will go down about 30 feet into granite. These are the kinds of cores that would result from that. But one can do other things with drill holes apart from simply extract core. Sometimes, after the core has been extracted, the walls of the borehole can be photographed with a borehole camera. The camera is contained in a steel cylinder about two and three quarters inches in diameter and 31 and a half inches long. The camera is a conventional 16 millimeter camera loaded with cassettes with about 25 feet of film. The camera's delicate mechanism is protected by the stainless steel tube. In front of the lens of the camera is a truncated conical mirror with the sides inclined at an angle of about 60 degrees. The mirror can be seen through the cylindrical window in the tube and thus the mirror throws under the film a circular picture of the walls of the drill hole. The tube is closed and sealed by joints of synthetic rubber made to very exact tolerances to the extent that this apparatus can be used under 7,000 feet of water if necessary. The camera's control circuits are kept on the surface and are checked before lowering the camera into the hole. First the mechanism which controls the film advance and then also that which controls the flash tube. Both are synchronized by a pulsing circuit, which can be started and stopped by the operator on the surface. Dry argon is injected at a pressure of about 14 pounds per square inch into the mechanism to prevent fogging of the camera's window. When the gas nozzle is withdrawn from the tube, the pressure inside the camera returns to atmospheric pressure and the gas inlet is then hermetically sealed. The first picture identifies the borehole and the date to ensure that the eventual photographs are compared with cores from the same hole. The operator checks the dials to make sure the camera controls are working properly and then the camera is lowered in the drill hole at a rate of about seven feet per minute. The camera is suspended from the lowering mechanism by electrical cable covered by steel wire. The steel wire is wound and overlapped so that the cable doesn't twist during the lowering of the camera. Otherwise, the camera would, of course, rotate. The